Often we have data which is only accessible through a REST API. We might want to get that data, maybe post to a REST API, and it'd be great to be able to provide that data in a seamless way, in a way which was just as straightforward as interacting with the database. Well, with BuddyBase you can. And in this video, we're gonna step through how to add a REST API based data source and, and everything that's involved with that. So back in my data tab, I'll click the plus and I'll add a REST API. We'll do a quick tour of the various components that are here, and then we'll build an endpoint collection. Queries tab is where we'll create and manage our queries. We can import the, we can, we can import using, oh wow, let's go. Cool. We can import a set of endpoints, either based on open API standard or Swagger standard, um, even a curl request, which will pull in the headers and um, anything that you've got from, from documentation. Um, JSON and YAML. There are lots of ways that you can import various um, endpoint collections you may already have created and gathered together. Headers is where we're going to manage our global headers. These are headers that would be sent with every request rather than just an individual request. So we can, we can have a look at those. We've got authentication where we can create authentication methods that can be reused by each of the endpoints within our collection. And we have variables, both static and dynamic. Static variables we set here and they will be available throughout every endpoint. Dynamic variables are variables that are set uh, during our request response cycles. So we might get back a variable from um, an endpoint either as part of the body or as one of the headers. And we can use those to create or update dynamic variables. So have a look at a bit of that as well. So let's create an API. So I'm going to create an API for Star Wars and specifically the Star Wars API, which is found on swappy.dev. So I'm going to, first of all, just get all people, get all people. And I get all people with HTTPS forward slash swappy.dev API people. And I'll send that request. Now for every request, I can set the access level. So this is what access level you need to be in order to have authority to send and trigger this request. So maybe only admin can do it, or maybe anyone can do it. You can make you can have that choice. By default, it's anyone. And I can select any auth that I've created elsewhere. We'll look at that in a second. For individual requests, I can set up bindings, parameters, which are query parameters, which will be appended to my URL, headers, which are specific to this particular request, any particular aspects, any body that I might want to send. So in this case, a get request doesn't have a body, but if I had a post request here, then I'd have the ability to be able to determine if this should be form data or encoded um, raw JSON, XML, or even raw text, depending on the context. If this is a paginated API, which this one is, we'll be able to explore that. And we'll see that in a sec. And then we have a transformer, a JavaScript function, which will transform our query request result. So we'll have a look at that in a little bit as well. So I've sent my request. And below, we'll see what I get back. This is the JSON response. There's a raw response as well, which doesn't tidy it up. The JSON just tries to, to tidy it up a little bit. You see, I have a count, I've got next, I've got previous, and I have results. And for the results, I've got an array of 10 results that I can see they're ready to go. And each result has various aspects about it. The schema then is inferring from the top level keys uh, what we're what we're kind of dealing with. So count, next, previous, and results. Now, what I might want to say is actually, I don't really care about that. I care about the individual results. So maybe I will send this again, and my transformer I'll set to return data.results. In that case, what actually is being inferred is this array of results. So if I look at the schema then, I can see for each of the people, these are the data we're getting. Um, and I'm also getting the top level to count the next, the previous. Um, so I'm getting not just the um, the details that are here, but I'm also getting this for each user. And the raw hasn't changed, but I've got access now to maybe some slightly more detailed results or slightly more relevant results. My schema is much more useful now. If I click into the preview tab, then I can see what these 10 results look like in a table. Um, so the schema again is being inferred. So even though it looks like only an individual item is being inferred here, that's, it is managing to know that it's an array of these items and we can see what that might look like in the preview. But often I want to get a particular person. 
So let's see, say we want to create a new person and we want to get person by ID. Well, the endpoint looks largely the same. So it's swappy.dev forward slash API people and then the ID. So API one, we get Luke Skywalker. 10, we're going to get Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, 22, we're going to get maybe Boba Fett. Um, and they're ready to go. But I would like this to be dynamic. So I'll add a binding and I'll call it person ID. And I'll set it as a default to one. And instead of typing in the ID here, I'll use my handlebars notation and I'll pass in the same binding name that's here as a variable. And if I send, if I send this, I'm going to get back Luke Skywalker. If I set it to 10 again as the default, it's going to come back to us. So we want Kenobi. As 22, it's going to come back as Boba Fett. But by having it as a binding, that's going to allow someone on the front end to be able to change this and be able to set it to a value that makes sense for them. We have headers which we can add and we can set. This is global headers. So this could be, you know, favorite character. And we could say that our favorite character was maybe Jar Jar Binks. It's a lie, but we could say it. And that's going to be sent now with every request. We'd have authentication. There's two types of authentication. There's basic auth, which is username and password. So we would have, you know, like Kevin and password. And there's also um, token based auth. Um, so we might have token auth. Um, token bearer token, and we can set the bearer token to be um, something um, static if it's a bearer token that you have for the globally, or you can set it to be the current user's OAuth token using this binding here. That way, if you have some OAuth fl flow that's storing the user's OAuth token, you can use it and inject it into this REST API. So back in an individual query, I can use those authentication strategies that have been set on the top level. So if I try to use my basic level, it's going to come back and say that's an invalid username and password. That's fair enough. Um, that's telling me that this is an API that uses basic auth and I don't know have the right password and username. If I set a token auth and send it, well, that's just coming back with the real data, which is just telling me that this API doesn't use token-based authentication, um, but because I don't have the right token either. So we can set, we set the auth level on the top level and we save it. And then when we want to use it for a particular endpoint, we select it and then save it as we go. My collection has two endpoints, which are both get. You could absolutely have a more complete collection, maybe one that you're importing from Swagger or OpenAPI definitions. And they're going to allow you to be able to make data available on the front end with the same level of ease as we can make it with a relational or non-relational database. So our RESTful APIs are as powerful now and as accessible for our users as our database tables. That allows us to stop data being siloed and allows our data to be as useful as possible to our users, turning our data into action as quickly and as readily as possible.